We don't think in terms of, well, we, we think first in terms of business risk. You know, we, we, the key to Graham's approach to investing is not thinking of stocks as stocks or part of a stock market. You're, the stocks are part of a business. The people in this room own a piece of a business. If the business does well, they're going to do all right as long as they don't pay way too much to join into that business. So we look at, we're thinking about business risk. Now, business risk can arise in various ways. It can arise from the capital structure when somebody sticks a ton of debt into some business, and so that if there's a hiccup in the business, that the, that the, uh, that the lenders foreclose. It can come about just by the nature of the business. Certain businesses are just very risky. Uh, back in when there were more commercial aircraft manufacturers, you know, Charlie and I would think of making a commercial uh, airplane, a, a, a big airliner, sort of as a bet your company risk because you would shove hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars out into the pot before uh, you really had customers. And then if you had a problem with the plane, you know, the company could go. There's certain businesses that inherently, because of long lead times, because of heavy capital investment, that, that basically have a lot of risk. And commodity businesses have risk unless you're the low-cost producer because uh, uh, the low-cost producer can put you out of business. Our textile business was not the low cost producer and uh, we had a, a fine management and, and and everybody worked hard we had we had a cooperative unions all kinds of things but we weren't the low cost producer so it was a risky business the the, the guy who could sell it cheaper than we could um, made it risky for us so there's a lot of ways businesses can be risky uh, we tend to go into businesses that inherently are low risk and are capitalized in a way that that low risk of the business is transformed into a low risk for the enterprise. Uh, the risk beyond that is that even though you buy, identify such businesses, that you you pay too much uh, uh, for them. That risk is usually a risk of time rather than loss of principle, uh, unless you get into a really extravagant situation. But uh, then the risk becomes the risk of you yourself. I mean, it, whether you can retain your belief in, 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 the, in the real fundamentals of the business and not get too concerned about the stock market. The stock market is there to serve you and not to instruct you. And that's, that's a key to owning a good business and getting rid of the risk that would otherwise exist in the market. You mentioned volatility. It doesn't make any difference to us whether the volatility of the stock market, you know, is, is that average is a half a percent a day or a quarter percent of a day or five percent a day. In fact, we'd make a lot more money if volatility was higher because it would create more mistakes in the market. So volatility is a huge plus uh, to the real investor. Uh, ben Graham used the example of Mr. Market, which is the, the and we've used it, I've copied it in the report, I copy from all the good writers, and Ben, said, you know, just imagine that when you buy a stock that you, in effect, you've bought into a business where you have this obliging partner who comes around every day and offers you a price at which you'll either buy or sell, and the price is identical. And no one ever gets that in a, in a private business where daily you get uh, a buy-sell offer by, by, a, by a party, but in the, in the stock market you get it. That's a huge advantage. It's the, and it's a bigger advantage if this partner of yours is, is a heavy drinking, manic depressive. I mean, it, 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 you know, the, the crazier he is, the more money you're going to make. So you should, as an investor, you love volatility. Not if you're on margin, but if you're an, if you're an investor, you aren't on margin. And if, if you're an investor, you, you, you love the idea of wild swings because it means more things are going to get mispriced. Actually, volatility in recent years has dampened from what it used to be. It looks bigger because people think in terms of Dow points, and and and, and uh, uh, so they see these big numbers about plus 50 or minus 50 or something. But volatility was uh, was much higher many years ago than than it is now. And uh, uh, you had the amplitude of the swings was was really wild, and and that that gave you more opportunity. Charlie. Well, it got to be the occasion in corporate finance departments of universities where they developed a notion of risk-adjusted returns. And my best advice to all of you would be to totally ignore this development. <laughs> risk had a very good colloquial meaning, meaning a 
substantial chance that something would go horribly wrong. And the finance professors sort of got volatility mixed up with a lot of foolish mathematics. And, and uh, to me, it's less rational than what we do. And I don't think we're going to change. <laughs> yeah, well, the finance department teach that, 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 that volatility uh, equals risk. Now, they want, to, they want to measure risk, and they don't know any other way. They don't know how to do it, basically. And so they, uh, they say that volatility measures risk. And, you know, they, uh, I've, I've often used the example that the Washington Post stock, when we first bought it, had gone, in 1973, had gone down almost 50 percent uh, from a valuation of the whole company of close to, um, say, 180 or 175 million down to maybe 80 million or 90 million. And because it happened very fast, the beta of the stock had actually increased. And a, a professor would have told you that the stock, the company was more risky if you bought it for 80 million than if you bought it for 170 million, which is something that I've thought about ever since they told me.